looks and feels like spring. Officially, spring did start back on March 20th, so we're getting into the thick of it. And with that, of course, we're going to see rising potential for severe weather over the weeks ahead. Let's take a look at the surface map. That powerful system that came through Texas earlier in the week, actually back over the weekend, has moved up into the Great Lakes region and stalled. The Canadian boundary, that likewise has stalled out there in West Texas. But lurking down to the south is our new Pacific system. See that right there? That's crossing the Rockies, actually the Sierra Madre, and got those northwesterly winds and blowing dust in Chihuahua and the dry sector way out there south of the Big Bend. But that's going to be emerging later this evening and producing a round of thunderstorms across much of central and south Texas. In the eastern U.S., we've got this weak little system here in Virginia. I think that may be the same one that moved northward off the Carolinas coast. Out in the western U.S., very mild, blustery north winds at Vegas, Blythe City, and even all the way down towards Phoenix with some very cool temperatures, and that's being driven by this Pacific High in the Great Basin region. Up to the north in Canada, very mild. Temperatures coming up into the 30s and 40s. But up to the north, winter has not quite let go. Still some strong northeast winds and temperatures struggling to get out of the sub-zero readings. And up there near Baker Lake, minus 24. And minus 23. Yeah, it's pretty cold all the way up into the central high Arctic but we're not expecting much of that air to come south, just the periphery that should make it at some point into the U.S. But what we had back in February, now that's, we're not going to see any more of that for at least nine months. Here's a look at our 250 millibar chart. Well, we've certainly got the jet stream over Texas, Oklahoma, all the way up into Kentucky and Pennsylvania. Winds with that jet close to 100 knots. And if we look a little bit further to the south, well, that's off the edge. But I think we're picking up some of the subtropical jet way down there. Out to the west, we've got that major trough in the Four Corners area. We went over that yesterday on the water vapor imagery. That's going to be headed out towards the central U.S. going into tonight and tomorrow. And then off the Pacific coast, some broad scale long wave ridging covering this entire area, only broken up by this cutoff low north of Hawaii. A quick look at the thickness and pressure tells me that, well, there is a bear clinic system down there in the Gulf. And if we look at the model forecast soundings, that jet actually has some pretty good depth, so this is probably not a subtropical jet. This looks to be a polar front jet. It's got all the characteristics we would expect of a polar front jet. The focus is once again on Texas, and I'm sure that's not great news for those of you in Illinois, Ohio, New York, where nothing is going on. However, yeah, this powerful weather system moving through the northern mountains of Mexico, you can see it right there with an unstable cloud field, cumuliform indicative of mid-level instability rolling through that region. You can put that into motion there, and you can see those cloud fields building up as we get the daytime heating. Now, the air mass out in front of it is quite dry. That's the air behind the dry line, so... Obviously, there's not much humidity to work with. And behind the cold front itself, pretty much the same story. So a lot of this convection is elevated. But it will be sweeping eastward through the afternoon into the overnight hours. Now you can see some characteristics to the cloud field here in Texas. Let's zoom in on that just a little bit. Because what you see here, this is a very classic presentation of a warm front 
This is something you need to be able to look for as we head into spring, because you're going to see this a lot. Well, I'll kind of lay this out for you. There's the front, and I think that extends up like that. And you can see the difference in the character of the cloud field. North of the warm front, gravity waves. Those are trapped beneath the frontal inversion. So this is down about 1,000 to 1,500 feet off the ground. And we caught a little bit of that on the opening clip. It kind of looked like cumulus that we were showing to you. But maybe if you take a closer look at that, you might see some of the flat structure. And same thing going on up there in Lubbock. But down to the south, we've got the actual warm weather cloud streets that you would see in the summertime. Those clouds are going to be a little bit higher. Basis maybe about three to 4,000 feet, maybe even higher than that. And they would take on a more vertical texture. And then as you move to the west, you can see the loss of tropical moisture. We just don't really have much of it at this time. So why don't we take a look at that on the mesoanalysis. We were looking for that front to be right in that area. And checking out the temperatures. Look at that, 88 degrees at Catula. And out there at Crystal City, same thing. The moisture also around 60, so a little bit of humidity. But you go up to the north there in San Antonio, it cools down to 70 degrees, and we have that east wind. And you can see that wind convergence right there. That's going to mark the front. That's a very classic indication. So if you analyze that, you're going to draw the front on the warm side of that gradient. So you're going to put it down in that area right there. So that's going to be your warm front. And up to the north, got a stronger flow of north wind. So there's something going on up in this region too. So that would also warrant additional analysis. And I think we could probably bring that down kind of like that. So let me just move that map around a little bit. What do we have here? Let's see, the warmest air in East Texas located right in this region here. We've got cold air off to the west. So I'm thinking there's probably a secondary cold front right through here, and that connects back up into here. Then I'm seeing that other boundary right in that region there. So how does that connect up with our surface analysis? Well, that's pretty close. I would want to actually bring that warm front a little bit further north. It's a little less clear what's happening in this region here around Ozona, Fort Stockton, but I think we would find the triple point in that region there. And of course, a great way to find the triple point is to find the northwestern edge of the moisture. Isodrosotherm analysis can be very useful for that, but I'll just kind of mark things out really quickly here. There's the 60 degree isodrosotherm. The 55 is going to run kind of like that. And you can see that it's kind of flowing up into the central Texas region, the hill country. And I would think the triple point is actually going to be right in that area there. So perfecting that analysis. I'm going to put a dry line right through there. And you see that 10 degree dew point at Sanderson. Yeah, that's that's the dry sector. So we're going to put that back door front kind of like this. It's kind of a mess, but it's going to go about like that. And then that uh, warm front. Yeah, that's pretty definite. So we're going to probably bring that up sort of like that. So there's a lot going on there in the Texas Hill Country around Junction, out towards Ozona, and this whole area just waiting for the upper level lift to be approaching from the west, and the surface cold front, which is way out in that region of Mexico. And there's not much data to go off of, but gusty southwest winds there at Chihuahua with very dry conditions. And there's all that upper level energy out to the west, acting on northern Mexico very strongly. And what we're going to see this evening is some consolidation of that upper level energy, very strong disturbance crossing Chihuahua. So things will be going downhill through the evening. 
and this is going to emerge out in the Big Bend area and the Rio Grande. This will be overnight during the convective minimum, but it will still have some effect. Looks like a lot of that energy coming up into central Texas and the Dallas area, actually. So this may be a little bit further north than what we thought yesterday. In any case, this will have an effect. And I'll just go right to the precip charts to show you how that works. So we're focusing on this area right here. There's the pressure and thickness. And finally, when that upper level system starts interacting with the moisture off to the east, that's when the convection forms. And there it goes, about midnight between Del Rio and San Antonio. And then it pretty much runs right up through the whole country towards Waco, Dallas, and moves up towards Western Arkansas by 9 a.m. So it's a very fast moving system. And you can see the cold air advection coming right back in behind that low. It's almost like that frontal system came out of nowhere. Let's back that up from 9 a.m. to 6 a.m. So it's in Dallas, 3 a.m. It's actually coming together right around Waco, emerging from the Rio Grande region. So that's how we go about analyzing that. Anyway, other than that, it looks like uh, some potential north of the front around Dallas, maybe isentropic lift, some upper level instability coming together, and we get this little cluster of storms moving up toward western Oklahoma, the Ozarks, and Springfield into the evening hours. And then, of course, we have that stuff come in later. And this will all move towards the east, and it looks like thunderstorm outbreak out in the Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois region tomorrow. That certainly has the look of discrete cells. Quick check of the soundings, moderate instability, very impressive shear, and the Hazard algorithm going for PDS tornado. 55 knot low level jet. Okay, so let's check out those uh, values for supercell composite. So this is this morning, overnight, and then here's tomorrow. This is going to be about midday. And that's the evening. So it does subside during the evening. And since there's not much camping, I think it is going to be kind of an early show. Pretty much the same area as last week. And of course, there's a potential for it to race further eastward than expected. That's what we saw with the models last week. And let's just see what else we have going on. Yep, some thunderstorms up there from Ohio, Indiana, Illinois tomorrow. So we'll have to cover that. And then a bit of a break on Friday as things rapidly move into the northeastern U.S. But that frontal boundary is still lurking off to the west. So if there's an upper level system, we may not be quite done with that. And it looks like that does pick up around... Saturday night in Tennessee and moves eastward during the day Sunday and into Monday. Then some cool weather, kind of cloudy down on the Gulf Coast, and then windy to start out the week in the north central U.S. with the approach of this next powerful system. That'll be something to watch. You can see that just plowing southeastward through Wyoming, Utah, Nevada. That's yeah, that's a very strong system for this time of year. And the main question, when is that going to hook up with the low-level moisture? So this is Tuesday morning. Let's check out that moisture there in Texas. And you can see it's getting there. 50 stew points all the way up to 3,000 feet, but lots of dry air just above. So while Texas gets its house in order with the moisture, the system approaches into the panhandles, and we could see some thunderstorms in Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, possibly around midweek. Anyway, we've got plenty of time to worry about that. So that'll be your forecast. Hope you enjoyed that. 
And we'll be back at you tomorrow on Thursday for another edition. Take care and have a great Wednesday evening. Bye-bye.